You're either in a performance or the church of God. If it's a performance, that's one thing. But if it's the church, that's a different thing altogether. This is church tonight, by the way. Amen. It's not a performance. Hallelujah. Amen. All right. Well, if you'll turn to the Gospel of John, please, chapter 3. John 3. Gospel of John, chapter number 3. Get that in one hand, 1 Corinthians 15 in the other. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. All right, John chapter number 3, one hand, 1 Corinthians 15, and the other. Now, I remind you once again that uh, doctrines covered in the Gospel of John aren't even mentioned in some of the other uh, evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is why John has far more attacks and assaults laid against it than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And this is why Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic gospels, an arbitrary designation. And the Gospel of John set aside as something different. The Gospel of John, if they can make it so, becomes a spiritualized book that really doesn't mean what it says, but you kind of get the spiritual meaning from it. In other words, it's not, a really, it's not really a historical account, or the doctrines are not practical doctrines. They're kind of uh, uh, spiritualized. That's the Gospel of John in the eyes of uh, many in Bible colleges and seminaries and pulpits. This is why you don't hear much about the new birth today. You very, hear very little about the new birth. You hear a lot about give your life to the Lord and let the Lord become the Lord of your life and let God help you with your problems and let God work in your life and all kinds of things like that that have nothing to do with the real issue. The issue is not whether God is working in your life. God works in the lives of unsaved people. The Apostle Paul said he separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace long before he ever knew him. It's not that. It's whether you have been born again the new birth. And the Gospel of John, chapter number 3, is the book text that clearly says you must be born again. Look what he says in John 3 and verse number 3. Jesus answered, said to him, Verily, verily, I say to thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he says that you must be born again. Now, some of the reasons for the new birth, of course, I preached on this Sunday morning, but I didn't get into some of the spiritual aspects of the reasons for the new birth, but the number one reason for the new birth is for the simple fact that you're dead in sins and trespasses and under a curse. And the only way the curse can be lifted is by the new birth. But the new birth does more than just simply lift a curse. The new birth makes you a child of God or a son of God. The new birth also makes you uh, an individual who now has come into a special divine relationship with God that can ne could have never been reached any other way because the new birth puts you in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by putting you into the Lord Jesus Christ, it puts you at the right hand of the Father, literally accepted in the Beloved. So the new birth changes you from a dead person to a living one, changes you from a child of hell to a child of God, and puts you in Christ and puts you at the right hand of the Father, seated in heavenly places. And this is why the Apostle says time and again that our conversation is not here on this earth, but our conversation is above. In plain words, our life, our living, is above. Our, our citizenship, he said, is in heaven. And the new birth is absolutely essential for that. The new birth in dealing with the issue of sin... The individual who is unsaved has no power over sin whatsoever. He is under the, he's under the curse of sin and he's under the condemnation he's un, and he's a slave to sin. As I said Sunday morning, the devil can take him at his will. The unsaved man, therefore, has no recourse against sin. So for someone to get up and preach to an unsaved man about his sin and about how to overcome his sin is a waste of air. It's a waste of time. Because you cannot, you have no power in you to overcome sin. But the moment you're born again, the moment that you're born again, the flesh remains the flesh. It doesn't change, but it can be sanctified, set aside by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. 
And the Bible says, The Spirit that now dwelleth in you quickens your mortal flesh. And I tend to believe that that means that the moment you are born again, from that moment on, your flesh stays alive by the presence of the Holy Spirit in you. Amen. That the life force in a believer is entirely separate and different from the life force in an unbeliever. Amen. An unbeliever's spirit goes back to God who gave it. And since that his, his, his life force, like uh, the book of Ecclesiastes says, it, the life, the breath of life in him, the spirit of life that God gives all living creatures, returns to the Father. But if you're unsaved, you do not have the Holy Spirit in you. So the Holy Spirit does not return to God the Father because you've never had Him to begin with. So what is keeping you alive as an unsaved man is literally animal life. The, kind of, the same kind of life that keeps a dog alive. The same kind of life that keeps, a, that keeps any other uh, being alive like that. And the moment you take your last breath, that returns to God, the giver of all life, you see. But the saved man is not subject to such a volatile, such a touchy thing because the saved man's life is t entirely in the hands of the Holy Ghost because he's keeping your flesh alive by his presence inside you, which, goes, which of course leads on to the logical conclusion that the moment the Holy Ghost leaves you, you're going to die right then, right? So there's no way that a believer can lose the Holy Ghost. You're sealed with the Holy Ghost, kept by the power of God. So therefore, there's a difference, though, between you as a believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I told you I heard a man say, and it was good for me to hear it, because every once in a while I hear something like that, drives me back to my books. Drives me back to the basis of what you believe. He said the body of Jesus Christ was a corruptible body. And he said when he died on the cross, obviously, he was saying he died as a consequence in other words, he died as the inevitable consequence of being crucified. Listen, folks. If the Lord Jesus Christ had not given his life, said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, he'd still be hanging on that cross. And if you believe that, you understand there's something different about him. He had to give his life. It could not be taken from him. His life did not ebb away from him in the process of, of, the natural, uh, of, uh, of the natural being. He reached the perfect age of maturity, which was 30, 33 years, and then he gave his life. That's the perfect age. That's it. That's, that's the age of maturity. So he gave himself. The Lord Jesus Christ's body was laid in a tomb. The body of the Son of God was laid in a tomb, and, Paul, and Peter said in Acts 2, it did not corrupt. There was no corruption. Now that's totally and completely unscientific. Because the moment the body dies, it begins to corrupt. It begins to corrupt. And in three days, you'd be in pretty bad shape. But three days later, the same body, he said, this same body rose from the dead. Which causes you to look at him and say to yourself, well, then he is the beginning of a whole new race or a whole new manner of being. Yes, he is. That's the idea of the incarnation. This is why God became flesh, dwelt among us. The flesh of God could not corrupt. The flesh of God was not subject to the laws of nature. The flesh of God was not subject to that. So the Lord Jesus Christ is alive right now in eternity with the same body He died with on the cross. Do you believe that? Yes, sir. All right. The same body. So that's, is that important, preacher? Yes, it is. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. This is why the new birth is so necessary. Verse 20. Now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Is Jesus Christ a man? Yes, He is. For as in Adam, first Adam, all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order. Christ, the first fruits. Afterward, they that are Christ at His coming. So He's the first fruits of them that slept. Was He dead? Yes. But was He dead because of the power of death? But or was He dead because of obedience to the will of God? In plain words, did death catch up with Him and take Him from this earth? Or did He submit Himself to the Father and say, Into thy hands I commend my spirit? Now what spirit did He command into the hands of the Father? Did He command simply the spirit of life that all living beings have? Or was it the Holy Spirit? He gave. 
He gave up life. The Holy Ghost is what kept him alive, just like he keeps you alive, because the Spirit of God dwelt in him. In plain words, what I'm trying to lead you up to is that as Christ is, so you will be. That's the point of all of this. As he was 2,000 years ago in this world, sinless, you will one day be sinless. And yet be living in a body, yet sinless. And sinless perfection is not attained. Sinless perfection is the gift of God. But sinless perfection was not the gift of God for the Lord Jesus Christ. Sinless perfection for the Lord Jesus Christ was complete and absolute obedience by the Son of Man to the will of the Father. Now look how the Apostle deals with this in 1 Corinthians 15. Every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits, they that Christ is coming. Then cometh the end. When he shall deliver up the kingdom of the Father, even God, uh, unto God, kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, authority, and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Amen. Now, death is a mysterious thing. There it is. In the Bible, the Bible talks more about death than any other book I know of. And it talks about death in every sense that death can be understood. It talks about the death of the soul, the death of the body, and the death of the spirit. All three. Scripture talks about it. It talks about what happens to the spirit, what happens to the soul, and what happens to the body. It tells you why the spirit is dead, why the soul is dead, and why the body is dead. The Bible tells you how, when to say the body is dead. The Bible tells you when the death of the body takes place. The Scripture tells you that. It tells you exactly when death takes place in a human body. When is it? Not the soul. As the body without the spirit is dead. The spirit controls the soul. The soul is simply what came into being when the spirit of life was breathed into the body and Adam became a living soul. God didn't make his soul. His soul came into being. Gave him a tripart nature. So when the Lord Jesus Christ died, was buried, and then rose again the third day, He rose again the third day, and at that resurrection He was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Romans chapter number 1. This day have I begotten thee, Psalm chapter number 2, when He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. That was used to prove the divinity or the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ because God was His Father. But God did not beget Him like anyone else had ever been begotten. The Lord Jesus Christ was begotten of the Father by the power of the Holy Ghost who came upon a virgin and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Therefore the Bible says that Christ was born of the Holy Ghost. He was through the Holy, through the Spirit offered himself without spot to God. He was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. They're inseparable. So the very moment the Holy Spirit left his body is the very moment that his body he yielded the Holy Ghost, his body died. But his body died unlike your body. His body did not die a terrestrial body and was raised a celestial body. His body was not raised a dishonorable body and, and died a dishonorable body and then raised an honorable body. His body did not die a, a terrestrial and raised a celestial or a temporary body raised an eternal body. And all the arguments that Paul gave in 1 Corinthians 15, same body that died was the body that was raised from the dead. That's a big deal. Do you know why it's a big deal? Because it proved in itself the fact that if his body was raised incorruptible, never saw corruption, that he truly was sinless, body, soul, and spirit. Because you see, death has power to kill. Death has power to kill because of sin. The strength of death is in sin. Sin is, sin is where death has its power. A sinless being, death has no authority over it. Death could not claim Jesus Christ. Death had no authority over him. Every being that has sinned, death has authority over them. Because the wages of sin is what? So therefore, a, sin, a sinner, a being that sins, owes death. <laughs> and death will come and collect its wages. In other words, it will come and collect. Death will pay the ultimate penalty for sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. That's what James says in James chapter number 1. But the Lord Jesus Christ was not a sinner. He was sinless. Death had no claim on Him. <laughs> so therefore, as an intruder... <laughs> 
He entered into death's domain. And I'm certain that when death saw the Lord Jesus Christ enter into its domain, they, it stepped back and took a look at him for a moment. <laughs> said, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing here? You don't deserve to be here. You're not paying any penalty. You're sinless. I have no authority over you. But thus to be so to fulfill all righteousness. When he was baptized in the Jordan River, isn't that what he said to John the Baptist? Let it be so to fulfill all righteousness. What righteousness? What is righteousness? How many times have I told you before that the only righteousness that means anything is the righteousness of Jesus Christ? All the righteousness you read about in the Old Testament is there for instruction and edification. Good, study it. But there's not one speck of it that will do you any good. The only righteousness that matters to the believer is the righteousness of the Son of God. And none of the righteousness of the Old Testament is like His righteousness. His righteousness is a righteousness that did not come down from heaven. It's a righteousness that originated in the earth. What do you mean? It's the righteousness of the God-man who is absolutely and completely obedient to the will of the Father. And by a sinless, perfect life, he obeyed God, and when he ascended to heaven, he entered into the presence of God with his own righteousness. Now you have two righteousnesses in heaven. You've got the righteousness of God the Father, which has been from eternity past into eternity future. He is sinless and pure. God is holy, holy, holy. But seated at his right hand is a righteousness of obedience that the Lord Jesus Christ lived out in this earth and ascended to the Father and offered to the Father. How could the Father accept the righteousness of someone else apart from himself? He had to because it was equal to him. It was the God-man. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation. The Lord Jesus Christ cannot be lifted any higher than he has been. And there is none above him. Now, did you hear what I just said? The Son of God is seated at the right hand, not below the Father nor above the Father, but at his right hand. And there is none above him. And if you read Revelation carefully, the day will come when the throne of God and of the Lamb become one. And he's seated there on that throne. How that works, I don't know. But I do know this. I do know the Lord Jesus Christ is not inferior to the Father. While he was in this earth, he was subject to the Father. He was subject to the Father as the God-man. But when he lived out a sinless, perfect life, there he was elevated to the right hand of the Father. The righteousness of the Son of God becomes my righteousness by faith. That righteousness is applied to me at the moment of the new birth. The moment I am born again, I get the benefit of all of the sinless life of the Lord Jesus Christ put on my account. Because the only way righteousness can be given to you is imputed to you. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't inherit it. You can't be born into it. The only way that the righteousness of the Son of God can ever be yours is for Him to give it to you. Amen. Impute it to you. Charge it to your account. It's your righteousness. That's what makes it possible for you to enter in the presence of God. Because only the righteous can enter in the presence of God. And righteousness and holiness are two different things. Holiness is that part where God and His being is separate and abides in a separateness that nothing else can approach unless they have a way to come into His presence. Righteousness is the, is, is the state of that individual as they begin to approach a holy God. And righteousness is the end result of a sinless, perfect life. Nothing can be said greater than of the Lord Jesus Christ than to say he's righteous. Sinless in this earth, righteous in the presence of God. So the body that was, that was, that was crucified <coughs> on the cross and was buried and rose again the third day 
That same body is seated at the right hand of the Father. This body dies, but it won't be the one that's raised. Because this body will go back from the ground from whence it came. Why? Because sin dwells in my mortal members. And that's what the apostle said. He said, sin dwells in your members. In your members. Well then, preacher, why doesn't God change this body? Well, he will. <laughs> kind of caught you off a little bit, didn't it? He will. That's the whole idea. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. Verse number 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? And then Paul kind of gets, I mean, he comes to the point, <laughs> thou fool. <laughs> it's kind of hard to carry on a conversation like that, but <laughs> he said, listen to what I've got to say. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be. So that makes it plain. But bare grain, it may chance of wheat or of some of the grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh of men, another kind of flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. He said, then there are celestial bodies, which has to do with the stars and the heavens, and bodies terrestrial, which has to do with the earth, from the Latin terra. But the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another of the moon, another stars, for one star differeth from another in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Was his body sown corruptible? No. I, mine is, though. And You know, well, my body's not. Well, we'll go back about three months after we bury you and dig you up, and I'll guarantee it. Well, I'll guarantee it. I'll guarantee it. Okay. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a, here it is, natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. And there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. And the King James translators put was made to give continuity to it. The Lord Jesus Christ was not created. But the sense is he was made to us. That's what that means. See, he was made to us a quickening spirit. So the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. In other words, a soul. But the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, a quickening spirit. The Bible says the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. Amen. Now, what voice do you think they'll hear? Let's put it this way. Let me, let me rephrase that. Do you believe that when the Lord Jesus Christ says, said, come forth, Lazarus, that Lazarus was obeying the voice of the Lord Jesus to come forth since he was lying there a dead man? Or do you believe that the voice of the Son of God that went into the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth, had the same creative power that God had when he said, let there be? See, absolutely. In plainer words, there was nothing lying there to receive what he said. But when he said it, he came forth. In plainer words, the word that went forth, the command, but it was also a creative command. It had power to give life. Lazarus come forth. That's what I mean by the resurrection. It's the same principle. Uh, when you go to the graves out here, friends, I mean, you, you know that. Uh, have you ever been to an old graveyard where the, where the grave is sunken? I've been in revolution. If you old gray cemetery over here is one of the oldest cemeteries in East Tennessee, old gray. And they've got a whole area over here with uh, conf uh, not not just Confederate. I think Civil War Civil War soldiers are buried over there. Some of the greatest leaders and I think even governors of Tennessee are buried in Old Gray Cemetery. Mayors, and all kinds of people. I mean, it's a it's a walk in history. If you've never been there, just walk through it. You'd be amazed. There are graves around you that are two hundred years old and older. You don't think there's much in there, do you? From dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Is that not what he said? Unless you do something to stop that. 
uh, they're going to come forth. I watched a documentary of three little Incan children they found on top of a mountain down there in South America. They've been offered up as child sacrifice. The, uh, the uh, what do they call that when a, when a volcano erupts? The ash had fallen down on their bodies. It was cold at the top of that mountain. It perfectly preserved them. It's an amazing thing. You ought to see it. You ought to see it. It's quite a remarkable thing. Little children, you can see their face, their hair. It's just like they were asleep. They were offered in child sacrifice 500 years ago. Their little bodies were up there. It's such a sad thing, such a sad thing to see these little children offered up like that. The Incas did that. They offered them as sacrifice to their God. But you see, that's, the, that's abnormal. That's an anomaly. That's not according to the law. According to the 500 years, there's nothing left. If from dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. So what comes out of the grave then? If all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth, then he's not raising dirt. But if all that was in that grave was dirt, what's coming out of that grave? He's going to raise a body. See? He's going to raise a body. What raises that body? It's the power of God. It's the power of the risen Christ. It is the creative power in His Word. When He said, Lazarus, come forth, He would come forth. How? Because the Word that went out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ created life again in Lazarus. In other words, gave him life that could respond to the voice of the Son of God. So the Bible said, all that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. Hallelujah. Who, who else would it be? It wouldn't be an angel. It would be the one that died for all mankind. Bless the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I want to see that. Man, I just want, I just want to be standing around somewhere on that resurrection morn and hear, that, hear, the, hear the voice of the Son of God. And I'm going to tell you something else, too, folks. Now, you know, I mean, they've got uh, shopping malls and interstates and, and landing strips built all over this place. They don't know what's buried underneath there. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but he may bust these interstates wide open and up from the ground comes uh, some of the founding fathers. Who knows? They're going to come out of the grave. I don't care if Walmart's sitting on top of it. They're coming up. Amen. And a body comes up. It's a body like in the body of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, what happens at the resurrection? Well, the Bible says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you saw or not, as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them that sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So how does he bring them with him, uh, preacher, and raise them from the dead at the same time? You've got to understand our nature, body, soul, and spirit. He brings spirit and soul from glory. Brings body from the ground. And then we shall be as He is. We doth not yet appear what we shall be, John said. But we know that when we see Him, we'll be like Him. For we'll see Him, hallelujah to God, as He is. Body, soul, and spirit. When you take that first breath in that body, that'll never die. When you take that first breath in a body that likened to His glorious body, a body that you know will live forever, a body that is never subject to death, nor sin, nor decay. And once you realize, now you are complete in all the work at Calvary has been consummated in your final completion and glorification, then you'll do some shouting. I bet you will. I don't care how dignified you are. I bet you'll do some shouting. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Shouting and glorifying God. Yes. <laughs> so the first fruits was Christ, and he that hath begun a good work in you perform it. He started something in you when he saved you. The new birth is the beginning. The new birth is the beginning. It's the beginning. And it's the start. And if the new birth hasn't taken place, none of the rest of the New Testament means a thing except the judgment. But you need to be born again. We say, oh, preacher, uh, do you have to be a Baptist to be born again? How many believe you have to be a Baptist to be born again? Nobody. Good. <laughs> how many believe you have to be a Methodist to be born again? Well, how many believe the Methodists have the only way to heaven? Baptist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Catholic, you know, Pentecostal? No. 
No, there's one gospel. And if you'll notice in 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle says, I declare unto you the gospel. He starts that chapter out by saying, I want to give you the gospel. The gospel. The gospel includes a lot of things, but the main thing of the gospel is that Christ died, was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. If you don't have that, you don't have the gospel. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray to use what I've said tonight, Lord. Help us get a little bit of understanding, Father, of what we will be one day. We will. We will. Our Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that tonight, if there's any here sitting in this auditorium that or watching by the Internet or whatever, they've never been born again. Show them tonight they can be. It's for them, too. It's not for some elite group, some chosen few, somebody that thinks that they have a corner and a handle on God's Word. But He tasted death for every man and would have all to be saved. Make a difference where you are, how dark your, your hole is, how wasted your life is, how hopeless it looks. Christ died for you. That means He died for you in the shape you're in. That's what's so important about this. He never asked anybody to clean their life up and come to Him. That's you trying to make yourself righteous. He does not accept anybody's righteousness. What He says to you is to come just as you are, just the way you are. Without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, bless the Lamb. Is there anybody in this house tonight who would like to come down here and have us pray with you? You can be born again. You can be. You say, I've tried, preachers. Not up to trying. It's just receiving what He did for you. He did, he did all the work. He doesn't ask you to do any work. Just receive what He did for you. Would you do it? Would you come? And what you're doing now, you're not receiving a bunch of doctrine and a lot of things that I've said. You're receiving a person. You're receiving the Lord Jesus Christ. He is salvation. He is. work. I emphasize this one part right here tonight. I feel so strongly to say this. Don't care where you are. Don't care what you've done. Don't care how dark your world is. Don't care how hopeless it seems. He wants you just like you are. And He'll receive you just like you are. Remember that. If you don't remember anything else about what I said tonight, He'll receive you just like you are. And I'm going to tell you something else, too. He will not turn you away. Amen. Amen. Any man coming to me, I will in no wise, no wise cast him out. Turn him away. Say no to him. Father, bless your name, bless your name, bless your name. Let your word, Lord, good seed that's been sown tonight. Maybe I watered what someone else sowed. But Father, tonight, let the good seed now, let it bring forth. Let it bring forth for the glory of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Amen.